howdy all, grab yourself a drink, it is time for some Path of Exile discussion. Today I wanted to talk about group play in a league start scenario. But this isn't a video about casual grouping during the axe. Although quick side note in editing, that's a lot of fun and you should definitely try it. This is a video about high-end grouping strategies for people who are looking to make multiple mirrors during the first week. Now I chatted with Gone, who's someone who has done day one simulacrum wave 30 and who regularly tries to get 10 mirrors week one between his groups. Group play is an extreme force multiplier in Path of Exile, but it's also very different to the way the game is normally played. And it's one of the very best ways to make a lot of currency fast, but it's also not everyone's idea of fun. What I want to do is give you a sense of some of the things that go through the mind of higher end group players, and give you a bit of a sense as to whether this play style is for you, and a number of tips that you can use if you are looking to take your group play to the next level. Now I want to start with something that's going to seem a bit off topic, and this is the unique item, Impulse's Broken Heart. The first 30 or so Impulse's Broken Hearts that drop in a league will trade for a Mirror Shard or even two Mirror Shards very early on. It's a huge loot acquisition multiplier for Zoomers, but by day 10 the item is often available for 20 Chaos. And even if it's not 20 Chaos, it's going to be one Divine. This is a really rare item. Something like 1 in 10 or 20,000 unique items that drop on the ground is going to be Impulse's Broken Heart. It's a really rare item. You're not going to see many of them in a league, even if you're not playing particularly casually. And if you're playing casually, you might go an entire year of playing without seeing this item once. But because group play is so efficient, all of that first 30 Impulse's Broken Hearts that drop, almost all of them are going to drop for the experienced group players who are going to be min-maxing. So when they get this lucky drop, it's a staggering windfall for them. Whereas if you or me get it playing solo on day 7, it's actually not much of a windfall. It's a lucky drop still, but it's nothing to write home about. Group play is all about getting these items while the demand for them still massively exceeds the supply. That's a key thing to keep in mind, and that's why group play is so efficient as a way to make a lot of currency in Path of Exile. But before we go too far, we want to ask the most important question. Is going hard on days 1 to 3, or even days 1 to 7, going to be fun for you? Only you and your group can answer this, and if you answer no, I implore you not to follow the advice in the rest of this video. You might still find it interesting to watch what people do, but it's not going to be something that you're going to want to replicate, because ultimately, it is much better to have fun playing the game than to wind up with 10 mirrors and complete burnout. So the first consideration if you want to get into high-end group play is finding the right group. In normal Path of Exile, group play is not particularly common, and if you do group up with people but your group doesn't work out for any of a number of reasons, maybe your players don't have appropriate skills to synergize with each other, maybe you just don't gel well as people, then you part ways and you continue alone and everything is fine. And all you really think is, gee, that was a waste of 20 minutes grouping up with those people in Act 4, I would have had more fun if I'd gone and done it all myself solo. But for optimised group play, you need to put a lot more effort into assuring group cohesion. And a huge part of this video is going to be focused on that exact question. Finding a group that's cohesive, finding a group that won't tear itself apart because of personal conflicts. And the reason this is so important is that characters that are optimised for group play often just don't function solo. So this means that you're going to be in a terrible spot if you wind up wanting to leave your group at level 75. You'll be sharing resources more than is normal in general play as well, and your group is going to invest in its members, but it's not going to invest equally in all of its members. There's going to be times when you're going to be investing all of your currency into your aura support character, or later on, all of your currency into the character that's doing most of their damage, and you don't want to have a situation where you're investing all this currency into someone and then they just decide to leave. A huge factor that people don't often think of is that party play grants so much extra power over single player play that a functional group is actually not that far behind a perfect group. So you could take a perfect group theoretically, which is going to have some of the best players in the game. Those people are going to be better than a functional group, but not by all that much. They're going to be quite close to each other because the functional group are just going to have the power to dominate all the content in the game. Now if you have a perfect group and you make a few play mistakes, those are going to turn your perfect group into a functional group. It's still going to work just fine. But group cohesion issues, where one person hates another person or anything along those sorts of lines, these are going to fracture the group entirely and they're going to ruin everything. Even if your group would otherwise be perfect, it's going to shatter and fall apart and then all of the players are going to be stuck on their own with a character that doesn't function except in a group context. That's why you'll notice that the next section of this video doesn't talk about character build choices at all, and that comes later. This is completely intentional. It is more important to have the right players than it is to have the right builds. 
and it's actually more important to have players that can get along well than it is to have players that are genuinely highly skilled at the game. Build issues, party composition issues, all of these are fixable pretty easily. Player and party cohesion issues are not. So let's go through some of these issues that come up with non-gameplay related group cohesion. This is the single most important consideration and that is why it's so much of this video. Even if your in-game goals align, low morale is a fun killer and it's going to tear groups apart. You'll need to consider a few major factors here. Firstly, you'll need to consider people's individual sense of humour. This is going to be a very significant factor. We'll come back to it later and why, because it seems like it's out of left field. But Goan, the player I spoke to who has run all of this high-end content so many times in the past, says that this is the single most important factor. Next, you have your attitude to mistakes, your willingness to engage in preparation, your availability, and the questions of leadership and the related question of yes people. Okay, so let's talk quickly about the question of humour and how it can tear a group apart. If you have a situation where one person in your group is recovering from depression and does not like dark humour at all, and then you've got someone else in your group who's had a really stressful environment, maybe they've been in the military or something, and their coping mechanism to get through that was the use of dark humour, this is going to be a really, really miserable time for one or both of those people if they're spending a lot of time together in a Discord chat. This is not to say that either of them are doing anything wrong, it's just that they're not going to be compatible to spend a large amount of time together. What you want to do is look out for problems like this. You as a group want to agree on some sort of boundaries as to what's okay and what's not. Now this is going to vary tremendously from group to group. One group might have military barracks style dark humour, one might have 4chan style no limits edgelord humour, and in that case I would definitely stay out of a group like that. Another group might have stereotypical big city university campus humour. Whatever you choose, agree on something and set limits. And if people want to set limits that just don't work for you, then in that case, it's time to find another group. This is really important because you are going to have a really miserable time if you end up with wildly divergent interests and wildly divergent senses of humour within a group. It's going to be a complete group killer. And remember everything we were saying about how cohesion in a group is actually more important than your technical skill with the game, well, this is going to be one of those cases where you don't have the most important thing, and therefore all the technical skill in the game can't save this group. And if you're still not convinced that this is a significant issue, imagine spending many, 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 many hours in the same Discord channel as someone that cracks puns as bad as the ones that I crack occasionally. Attitude to mistakes in game comes second, because everyone makes mistakes. Now I had a weird experience of sharing a university office with someone who was a very, very skilled poker player, almost at the professional level. And he taught me a lot about the game that he loved. But one of the things that came up a lot was the concept of players going on tilt. You play badly because you're angry at yourself for a past mistake, and so you keep making more and more mistakes. And poker players will often learn to recognize tilt in their opponents and try to exploit it when it exists. If you go hard at league start, you will get tired. If you're tired, you're gonna make mistakes. If you make mistakes, you run the risk of going on tilt. Tired players stuff up unless they're Ben or I'm Exile. Now, if you're already one of the best 500 players of Path of Exile and you're trying to become one of the best 20, in that case, you can be hard on yourself. But if that's not the case, you want to be relaxed about mistakes. Tilt is a group killer, mistakes are not. The third major group killer related to group cohesion is when the group has a mismatch in its level of dedication and its availability. Ideally, all players in the group will want to play about the same amount in week one, give or take a few hours. And also they're going to want to play at roughly the same time of the day. Now this is entirely workable if, for instance, you've got similar time zones that aren't exactly the same. Maybe one player's in Scotland, another player's in Germany, or maybe one player's in Singapore and another player's in Sydney. In either of those cases, if you work nine to fives, you can make it work. But on the flip side, what if one player's in Jakarta and the other player's in Honolulu? This is definitely not going to work. You're going to have major problems here, unless the general hours that you keep are wildly different. You don't want to keep this in mind because it's something that's going to risk tearing your group apart. But the biggest sticking point here is actually not so much once the league begins, it's how much you want to play before league start. From talking to Gone, one run to Act 7 and another run to Act 4 is the bare minimum, but he recommends three runs to Act 4 and one that goes at least as far as two Void Stones, but ideally goes as far as a simulacrum wave 30. You want to agree on the amount of preparation that you do before starting, and in a lot of ways you can think of this as your tabletop RPG session zero equivalent as well. If it turns out that you've got wildly incompatible senses of humour, it's going to come up while you're chatting in Discord while you're doing an Act 4 run, and at that point you can say, you know what, thanks for the time, but this isn't going to work out, and move on and find a different group somewhere else. 
Finally, you need someone who is the leader, someone who has absolute final decision-making power and is respected enough to make the right call. And this person should have an absolute veto that the group will at least begrudgingly respect for time critical decisions. For example, you might've gone into the league with a plan to do the simulacrum early, but there's a whole bunch of shouting on Reddit that there's unconfirmed reports of stealth nerfs to simulacrum drops. Your group needs to buy a Prism Guardian in order to do the simulacrum. Do you trade for it? Do you throw away 70% of your league wealth in order to pick up a Prism Guardian when you're not sure you're gonna get a payoff on it or not? Here, this is a decision that's going to need to be made by the group leader. Likewise, the group leader is gonna have the responsibility of calling a break when people are tilting. And ideally, the group leader's final decision-making power won't be used, but you do need to have that plan and that is a fallback in case it is needed. One example where this came up for Gon, you recognize that one party member wasn't having fun at all, but also wasn't willing to be the one to initiate a split up of the group. Gon privately talked to this person, confirmed the suspicions, and then unilaterally ended the group before they'd achieved all their goals. This was to ensure that the yes person didn't have a completely miserable week that would drive them away from Path of Exile for good. This is a not so obvious part of the leader's job. It's also something that any of you that have ever been the leader of a guild in an MMO will be intimately familiar with. The sorts of scenarios that don't come up often, but when they come up, they're extremely important to get right. Finally, you're also going to be involved in time management in this situation. The leader's gonna to need to schedule breaks. If something comes up and someone needs an extra one, there's always map rolling or searching trade for upgrades to do in the interim. The main thing is you don't want people sitting around going on tilt doing nothing because a critical party member is not available. You need to find something else that's useful for them to do, even if it is just boring work like trading for scarabs. The most important point when it comes to group cohesion, and one of the final points we'll make here, is that you wanna set achievable goals for your group that align with your idea of fun. 10 mirrors in week one is gonna require focus, dedication, and a lot of play. If that's not gonna be fun, that's fine. Don't aim that high. It's better to share two mirrors and have fun getting there than it is to share 10 mirrors and then be sick of Path of Exile as a result of going too hard there. On the flip side, there's plenty of people that love the experience of going that hard as well, and that's what they live for, that's what they play for. If you're in that category, then yeah, definitely go for it. So that's all on group cohesion and things that can tear your group apart. Like I said, it's a big topic because it's such an important one. The next thing I wanted to do is give some quick tips that are related to the axe. Now, the most important tip is going to be to run one practice run to act four, and then a second one to about act seven. That will give you a real sense of the parts of the game where splitting up matters the most. On top of that, act eight does have a couple of extra bonuses if you do split up. You can have one player run Bathhouse and Yugal while the rest of the group rushes to the Ankh and then to Tolman. One thing you really want to... One thing you really want to remember in the axe is that deaths in the labyrinth are awful. You are going to be running characters that don't function very well solo. For that reason, you're going to want to stick together in the labyrinth. And this means you're going to want to do the labyrinth a little bit later in progression than you normally would. And you want to be a lot more powerful when you do it. You also want to take it slower than you normally would. One of the key reasons for this is that players may well have high ping in the labyrinth. And that ends up being pretty disastrous unless they're near people that have got auras. And also it's easy to fall a screen and a half behind in the lab and then feel under immense pressure to catch up. Instead, you do wanna move as a cohesive unit through the lab. Yeah, this is gonna be a bit slower, but it is better to succeed in the labyrinth in seven minutes than it is to die four minutes into one run, then complete on your second attempt in six. Stone Golem is a godsend in labyrinth as well, especially if you've got high ping. You wanna track player XP during the axe carefully. If one player falls five levels under the zone they're in, what I recommend you do is you stop everything and you level that player three times. That's gonna then ensure that they don't fall miles and miles behind. Otherwise, there's a few good split points, but they're pretty well known and all of them are prior to Malachi. You will pick these up on your Act 4 practice run and that's the reason you're gonna do multiple of those. The next question we wanna address is things related to RNG. And we're gonna start with the question of RNG related crafts. As a group, you need to discuss your tolerance for crafts that can fail after a large amount of currency is sunk into them. You don't want to attempt RNG crafts with group resources unless you can afford a lot of failures. I suggest you mathematically determine the average number of failures you're going to have and don't attempt it unless you've got enough currency to, on average, succeed five times. Also, don't try to make a mirror tier item. There are some of you who are watching this video who have a lot of experience in group play who are very much capable of making a mirror tier item. You know who you are. Even if you can afford to fail, Every fracturing orb used is half a mirror shard gone. That's usually the case all the way through. 
The next RNG point out relates to content that is very RNG heavy. So the same principle applies to bosses and other content where rare jackpot drops make up most of the value. A good example of this is the Eater of Worlds and its Uber version. You want to ask yourself, how am I going to feel if I trade for 50 Eater of Worlds entry tokens, run the Uber Eater of Worlds 50 times and get zero Ashes, zero Nimus and zero of the top end Forbidden Flesh Jewels. If this is going to completely tilt you, then you should run other content instead. It's not likely that you'll get 000, zero, zero there, but it is possible. Essence Memories are an extremely safe option. They're very difficult content, the monsters are really tough in them, but there's very, very little RNG involved. So if you're ever in doubt, run those if you want access to content that has almost no RNG in it and that will make you a lot of currency. Further on RNG, you're just not that reliant on big lucky drops. A lot of people think that most of the wealth that rich players get in Path of Exile comes from getting a really lucky Apothecary drop or a really lucky Headhunter drop. No, this is not true. Those things, if they happen, are a bonus, but the vast majority of the currency you make will be by selling large amounts of items that are a quarter of a Divine to five Divines early in the league. Many of these would only be 20 Chaos later in the league. Huge drops like Apothecaries or Mirrors might happen, but if they do, they're just a bonus. What you want to do is just keep trading for mirror shards while mirror shards are cheap. Now we're going to come to the question of group composition and we want to start with one of the biggest questions, which is whether or not you have a dedicated trader for your group. Good traders are going to be worth their weight in divine orbs, but they will want a large cut of the amount of currency that you gain. 30% is common for a six player plus one trader, seven person group. And honestly, even with that larger cut, the trader is an excellent asset to your party. If you don't have a trader, you're going to need one player who is not your aura support and not your carry, who handles all the trading. This person will sometimes sit out a map just to source scarabs and to sell items. Sometimes they'll sit out a map to roll maps and they will portal out when there's a significant trade. This job will suit someone who makes a standard Path of Exile character that can function pretty well on its own, but that has a few little nods made to group play. For example, maybe they're playing a stock standard build, but instead of using their normal ring, they use the unique ring Anathema. And then instead of whatever would normally go in their gloves, they socket Bane linked to three curses. This is an example of someone who's playing a standalone character, but that's modified so that it's more effective in group play at the expense of being slightly weaker when solo. A character like that can pop into group content when needed and can also solo content themselves on the side. And it's going to be particularly good if they're running expedition logbooks on the side. Then they can also be selling a whole bunch of items that they craft with ROG. Now, if you do have a dedicated trader, they're not going to work on their own character power at all. They may not get into Axe even until the end of day two. They're going to be rolling maps, they're going to be crafting for profit, they're going to be sourcing upgrades for the team, and they're going to be snaffling bargains that you're going to need later. They will, however, need help killing beasts sometimes, and the main party members should be willing to do that when it's useful. For party composition beyond the question of a trader, party composition at its core in Path of Exile, when you optimise it, is about force multipliers. Or as a balance to be good in solo play, but in groups you can run more of them and they often multiply with each other, heightening both offence and defence at the same time. Your first two characters in a party are always an aura support and a carry. Each of these addresses the other's weakness. So the killer weakness of an aura support character is that they can't do damage themselves. The carry absolutely excels at doing that and projecting it all over the screen. The killer weakness of a carry is that they're gear dependent. The aura support provides all the elemental resistances they need and a huge amount of additional damage as well. So that means that even with rubbish gear, they can function very well. After the core two members, other useful members include a curse bot, a Mana Guardian, which might in 3.22 actually look like a Mana Hierophant that pulls nodes out of the Guardian Ascendancy with Forbidden Jewels. We'll have to see exactly how that shakes up. A Magic Find Color, a Trader, and a Link-based support character. And I'm sure that you can come up with other options as well. Not all of these roles are required, and players can actually fill multiple roles, but at the cost of being a little bit worse at each. And here we have that same situation where a character who is not a Curse Bot can just put Anathema into their build, and can replace a four link with Bane linked to three curses. And then they're not a real curse bot. They're a lot worse than a real curse bot, but they can provide a moderate amount of curse support, which is then a force multiplier for the entire group. And that can help in defeating tough bosses. So they can do this at the expense of being a little bit worse at whatever the rest of their character is set up to do. Let's start with the most important of these though, and that is the aura support. So aura support characters scale explosively in early endgame. By early endgame, I'm talking white and yellow maps here. In this situation, the aura support character is going to get access to more and more mana reservation efficiency 
both on the passive tray and also on gear, and then potentially also on cluster jewels as well. And they're also at the same time going to get aura effect. Both of these stats start becoming more available in multiple places, and they multiply with each other, causing the aura support to become much, much, much stronger. And this is even more true for those auras that double dip on aura effect. Hatred, Grace, Determination. All of these scale quadratically rather than linearly with the amount of aura effect that you've got. Or in the case of Grace and Determination, if you also add Defiance Banner and Iron Reflexes, you can even get Quintuple Dipping happening there. Now in the Axe, the aura support character will not be a star. They're going to be carried by the rest of the group. They'll run Grace and they'll run the best damage aura for their carry early on. And then they'll add Determination when they can fit it in, which will typically be when they hit 50% mana reservation efficiency. They'll also use Smite for a little bit of damage on the side, but mostly because Smite provides that aura. Someone else in the group is then going to run Purity of Elements. This allows the rest of the group to finish the axe and finish quite some way into maps on complete and utter rubbish gear with minimal investment in elemental resistances, and the aura support is going to mean that they need minimal investment in damage as well. Your key early upgrades in maps on an aura support. You want Sign of the Sin Eater, Victoria's Influence, and Matua to Apuna. All of these are super common, super cheap uniques as of 321, and I see no reason they're likely to change in 322. These are the most important upgrades under 100 Chaos. You can also go for Alpha's Howl as well, but that can be a bit more expensive. Once you've got these upgrades, your carry almost doesn't need gear. They should be capable of doing the feared on a 5 link or even on a tabula. Your group should ruthlessly prioritise getting these items for the aura support first. Once you've got them, then and only then do you start investing in your other characters. So loot priority overall, because the aura support has so many early upgrades that are so powerful, you should be spending almost all your group's early currency on the aura support. By the time that your support has all of these items, all that your carry will have is probably just plus one caster sticks and a five link, or if you're using a bow, then it'll be some other equivalently rubbish weapon there. Your key intermediate upgrades on an aura support, and these are things you want to aim for before your group has 50 divines total. You want a Prism Guardian, you want level 21 Purity of Ice, Fire and Lightning, so all three of those. You want Coruscating Elixir, you want Enlightened level 3, but you want to get the basic gear for the carry, i.e. a 6 link, you want to get that stuff before you focus this much on the aura support. So basically the aura support gets the first items, then the carry gets a few, then it's back to focusing on the aura support for a little bit. There is an alternate upgrade path as well, instead of the Prism Guardian option. And here you can go for Val Caress with level 18 Val Impurities. So Val Impurity of Ice, Val Impurity of Fire, Val Impurity of Lightning. And you can also fit one of Val Grace or Val Haste into that same set of gloves. And a quick reminder that Val Caress will boost the gem level of the non-Val version of these auras as well. So you don't even need to have the Val version hotkeyed. You can also look out for three passive reservation clusters with 25% increased effect and no notables at all. Note that introspection is not an option here. And you can have a look for something that might be someone's lucky drop. The Eternal Struggle is a unique amulet that can drop from the Infinite Hunger, but if it does drop from the Infinite Hunger, you're not interested. And it can also drop from the Black Star. It's the Black Star ones you're going to be interested in. If they've got 13, 14, 15, or 16% increased effect of your non-curse auras as an implicit, which is a rare outcome on ones that drop solely from the Black Star, then this is a fantastic item. If one of these pops up in trade, you want to snaffle it up quickly because it's one of those things your aura support is not replacing anytime soon at all. In fact, they'll probably never replace it. That said, this is neither common nor cheap. So let's talk about the carry here. The name because their damage will make them feel like they're carrying the entire party. This player has all the damage in the world from Hatred and Wrath, if their skill is one that benefits from both. Spark and Lightning Arrow are top choices here, but generally speaking, pretty much any Lightning skill that isn't absolutely awful can be used here. For example, you can use Crackling Lance if you want. Damage projection is key for the carry because they've got so much externally provided damage that they don't really need it. What they need to do is hit as much of the screen as possible and let the Aura Support's damage carry the day. Early gear for the carry doesn't matter. Your aura support is going to carry you, providing resists, flat damage, and damage multiplying. But, you do want to look out for Call of the Brotherhood. It's an extremely good unique item, it's going to let both Wrath and Hatred have full power on your character. Your typical upgrade path as a carry looks like this. You want to use 4 link leveling rare garbage items until 2 void stones. Then you want to pick up a 5 link, or a tabula, and plus 1 scepters, or a tier 1 attack speed bow. 
You want two times Call of the Brotherhood when this is reasonable, which may or may not be in the first 10 hours of the league. And defensively, because you're going to be getting a lot of elemental resistances from your aura support, you don't really need the same sort of life resist gear that players are generally after at this point. Instead, you want chaos resistance, you want life, and you want suppression if you can get it. Auras will do most of the rest for you. Now when you're trying to push to harder content like Uber Pinnacle Bosses, 100% Delirium or other aspirational content, you want to upgrade to Nebulous or to a good bow and all around good gear. Don't bother with Inspired Learning, don't bother with Replica Headhunter. These things aren't completely useless, but they're generally overpriced. Your next priority as a carry is going to be some quite large, quite expensive items. And here we're going to have a very unusual seeming priority list because the most expensive item is first. So once you can afford to spend more per item, your first priority is getting a headhunter. Now this is a lot of saving up. It may seem like it's better to buy one of the cheaper items first, but you'll find that the cheaper items will drop in price, whereas headhunter won't. So that's one factor. And the second factor is that headhunter is just the best value of these upgrades. However, Oriath's End is your second most important upgrade. And if Oriath's End is unusually cheap, if you can pick it up for less than about 20% of the price of a headhunter, then in that situation you want to bump it up to first priority. So save up for headhunter. Once you've got enough liquid currency that if an Oriath Send comes onto the market cheap, you can buy it, then that's the spot you want to be in. Keep an eye out for that cheap Oriath Send. If it appears, yoink. If it doesn't, then just keep saving to headhunter and buy headhunter when you can. After that, Aegis Aurora will keep your carry alive through things that otherwise are not survivable. Enlightened 4 will make your aura support miles better. 35% reservation clusters are also phenomenal on your aura carry. And if a cheap aura effect synthesized helmet shows up, absolutely positively grab it. It probably won't because these are pretty rare and they're pretty sought after, but if you do find one, definitely grab it. Now one very important note that has to be made here, there is a lot of trust that's involved in this sort of prioritization. Now a lot of you are probably thinking in phase one, all the wealth of your entire group is tied up in your aura support, and in phase two, all of the wealth of your entire group is tied up in your carry. Your carry may end up having a headhunter and an Oriath's end when no one else in the entire group has even a single three divine item. In this situation, trust is essential. There's no real getting around this. If you can trust your group, you can be more efficient than groups that can't trust each other can be. This is unfortunate, but it's just a fact. And ultimately, you want to have a group that you can trust here. The next topic we want to discuss is what to do when things seem like they're going wrong. Pivoting. Sometimes your plans can fail. There can be stealth nerfs, there can be unexpected opportunities that you want to switch into, all sorts of things can happen. The more that you've practiced and the more that you trust your leader's judgment, the more that you're able to change your plans on the fly. You can seize a new opportunity or you can dodge an unforeseen bullet. Don't, however, pivot just because of one Reddit rumor. It is always the case that there will be posts made on Reddit claiming that there's been a stealth nerf to some mechanic. Sometimes these posts will be true. Most of the time, they'll be ill-informed posts. Occasionally, they'll even be malicious posts that are aimed at swinging the entire league economy and suppressing demand for a particular item or increasing demand for another item. So don't trust just one Reddit post. The more that you personally know about statistics, the more accurately you can tell whether a bad string of luck that you've had is just an unlucky streak or whether it's evidence there's been a genuine stealth nerf that's taken place. And it is very common for grinding your games to change the rarity of unique items without documentation in the patch notes. Sometimes this will make an item more available. For example, in patch 3.19, they made it considerably more common to get Beric's Respite, which dropped from tier one rarity, i.e. staggeringly rare, to tier three rarity, where it's just an uncommon item. But sometimes they do the reverse as well. Who knows, maybe Victario's influence will be considerably rarer in patch 3.22, and we're not gonna find out until we've got people in maps looking for it, and the item is much more expensive than it normally is. At that point, you're gonna to need to have some sort of pivot. Now what you don't want to do is pivot if your group is already making 3 plus divines an hour, which in week 1 is 1 mirror shard an hour. And simulacrum is always your fallback. If you make a plan and something completely and utterly ruins it, then you can fall back to the simulacrum. It's there as your plan B if your plan A is dead. Also related is the concept of hedging. Pivoting is when you haven't planned a change. Hedging is when you slightly sacrifice in advance of needing to in order to be better at pivoting in case it becomes needed. What you want to do is at least consider possible pivots if you're going heavily in on a strategy that some players consider to be broken or degenerate. For example, 5-way legions. You personally might feel that 5-way legions are completely balanced, but lots of players disagree with you, and grinding gear games are the ones that matter. Not whether you think that's broken or not, but whether grinding gear games do. 
they will decide whether it needs to be nerfed or not. And so even if you don't think it needs to be nerfed, you will need to plan around the possibility that it might have been nerfed. And that means you'll probably want to have a backup strategy in mind. The next topic to discuss is early investment. Now, most people think invest early in the Path of Exile concept means that you want to trade for divine orbs early or pieces of mirrors or tailoring or tempering or fracturing orbs early on in the league. We're going to be talking a completely different concept here. Instead, you're going to be spending your early currency on items that you know will fall in value, but they're things that will make you faster. For example, you might buy a Coward's Trial Map for 50 Chaos because it's going to give your group plus one Atlas bonus and it's going to give each member of your party plus one character level. This is a worthwhile return, even though that same map might be only 20 Chaos the next day. You should still buy these things because getting plus one to your Atlas bonus is going to make every map you do in the future more lucrative than it otherwise would have been and you'll easily amortize the extra costs that you've paid by buying that Coward's Trial early rather than waiting for it to fall a little bit later. What I suggest you do here is you invest in your progression for the first 30% or so of your group's expected playtime as a cohesive unit. But after this point, you want to start trading for things that will be worth a lot more currency later in the league. Gone generally goes for 10 mirrors combined in the group by day 7, but the first one sometimes comes day 2, sometimes day 3, sometimes day 4. Often the second mirror will be on day 4, and then there'll be 8 more over the subsequent days. Mirror shards will just roll in once you're blitzing aspirational content while most other players are not yet in that aspirational content and are not yet close to it, but want the loot that it drops. It is also completely and utterly fine to finish yellow maps with negligible wealth across your entire group, maybe even less wealth per player than a solo player would have. One of the most important points that's going to set you up is your early atlas progression. Early on, you want to prioritize getting two void stones and permanent Exarch influence ASAP. Exarch influence just adds so much more wealth to every map that you run, and then you can fill in missed maps on your atlas at a later point in time. It is perfectly fine to be missing maps for a little while, you'll be able to pick them up easily enough, especially if one player needs to take a break, then you can go and trade for all of the maps that you need, and you'll be able to just bang out everything on your atlas really fast at that point. There's also something you can do that is unique to groups, and that is you can take advantage of having multiple atlas passive trees. Each member of the group has their own independent Atlas passive tree. At least for all the points that come from maps, every player in the group is going to get those points and that's going to really, really speed you up. And that's going to give you a lot of points really quickly and a lot of flexibility between all your different Atlases. I recommend that one player leaves their Atlas completely blank. They're gonna stock up a whole bunch of points, but they're ready if you need to pivot a certain way. Your aura support is gonna start out by opening all your maps. This player is going to spec all of Abyss and is going to spec lots of map sustain. They're also going to path next to Wandering Path. Now the goal here is not that you're running a Wandering Path Atlas most of the time, but whenever your map pool runs low, you're going to take Wandering Path, that's then going to double a numerical effect of all of your map sustain nodes, which is then going to help you over sustain maps. This is also the time to use any Cartographer's Scarabs you happen to own, throw those in when you're running maps while Wandering Path is active, and that's also going to help you with additional map returns again. Other players' atlases should spec very different mechanics to each other. This allows you to pivot between the different atlases as scarab prices adjust. So for instance, if it turns out that it is really, really popular to be running Gilded Legion scarabs, you might decide early on that you want to have a part of that action, so one player spec their atlas for Legion. Then at some point you might decide, you know what, we're out of this. We're going to do something else. We're going to go do Expedition instead. You've probably picked up a bunch of Expedition scarabs. You can easily trade for them. Maybe they're cheaper than usual this league. And then you can buy up all those Expedition Scarabs and the second player's Atlas has an Expedition spec so you can run all those Expedition Scarabs on an Expedition Atlas. And then maybe Breach Scarabs become cheap. Well then in that case, you can jump over and run some Breach content as well. Now once your characters are really strong, two final things. This is the time where you want to start buying Mirror Shards or other pieces of mirrors or other consumables that are not worth using on early loot. Fracturing Orbs, Tempering Orbs, Tailoring Orbs, etc. Things that go up in price as rich players become richer. Consumables that are too precious to use on early league gear are perfect. You want to trade aggressively for these items with a view of reselling them when they're worth more later. Other than that, you're going to be spending your time running 100% Delirious maps, top end side contents like Wave 30 Simulacrum, 4 times Winged Scarab mapping, Maven 4 ways with awful mods. You want to be running content that the typical endgame player is nowhere near able to do in week 1, but that the typical endgame player can buy some of the loot from. That's going to be where you're making all your currency. 
you're going to be beating the Uber Maven while other people still want the boots that drop 40% of the time from both the regular and the Uber version of the encounter. But while the other people that are buying Maven's Ritz are buying them based upon the drops of the normal Maven, you're also going to get the Uber exclusive drops. You're not likely to get very many of them, but you will get a couple of them, and that's going to be a huge extra boost. You're going to be getting all of the extra benefits of doing the Uber Maven while the regular Maven is still profitable. And you're going to be able to sell these while the demand for them exceeds the supply. That is the key thing, that is the key benefit to highly optimised group play. But finally though, ask yourself that most important question again. Is going hard on days 1 to 3 or days 1 to 7 going to be fun for you? If you answer no, please don't do it. Make sure that you prioritise having fun higher than you prioritise success, because ultimately that's going to be what's going to give you an enjoyable league and is going to make the game worth playing for you. That's all i got on this. May your Valobs and your Fracturing Orbs have interesting results, and I will see you around.